Hi everyone, and welcome to this video where we look at another member of my classic computer collection. And today we're going to have a look at the Acorn A4000. Now, the Acorn A4000 is a member of the Acorn Archimedes line of desktop computers. They were never that successful commercially, and in fact some of you may never have heard of these particular machines. But they are of historical interest uh, for one reason, and that is they are driven by ARM architecture microprocessors. These are microprocessors that Acorn pioneered, and they have a reduced instruction set computing architecture. From their humble beginnings at Acorn and uh, in the machines like the A4000, they've got on to be simply ubiquitous and can be found in many, many computing devices, particularly smartphones, tablets, and even hobby devices like the Raspberry Pi. So that's the reason why I've got one of these machines in my collection. So let's have a look at it. Acorn began life as a computer company in Cambridge, England in 1978. Their big break came in 1981, when they won a contract to produce a computer for the BBC's Computer Literacy Programme. The BBC was a popular computer in British schools, and it gave Acorn the money and the stimulus it needed to continue research and development, especially into new microprocessors. They were aware of the Berkeley RISC project and decided to focus on developing new fast and inexpensive processors with a reduced instruction set. The result was ARM architectures. Their first ARM chip, seen here, was used as a coprocessor in a BBC Micro to develop code for the ARM environment. The first Acorn desktop, with a RISC-based ARM processor at its heart, was the Archimedes, released in 1987. A brand new operating system to take advantage of the new processor was also written. In the original Archimedes, this OS was called Arthur, but with later models it was simply called RISC-OS 2 and then RISC-OS 3. The Archimedes was powerful and fast, but largely remained in a niche market, mostly as upgrades to BBC Micros and schools that had opted for the latter a few years before. Acorn shouldered on, however, developing further ARM-based processors and other Archimedes desktop models which contained them. Eventually, Acorn dropped the Archimedes moniker, using just a simple A in front of a model number. This brings us up to 1992, and my own A4000, fitted out with 4 megabytes of RAM, powered by an ARM250 microprocessor, and running RISC-OS 3. This model was the last of the Acorn Archimedes desktop machines. Here you can see it plugged into a standard Super VGA monitor. The computer has a small, low pizza box form factor. It's very minimalist in appearance, which I like. Compared to other desktops of the day, it's also extremely light. And yes, the keyboard is very yellowed up on the top. It could do with a retrobrite. On the front we can see on the right an on-off switch and one 3.5 inch floppy disk drive. The machine can read, write and format MS-DOS disks thereby making it easy for people to transfer data from that environment. It also supports Atari ST disks. Around the back from left to right we can see power connectors for the main unit and the screen, a plug for the keyboard, a parallel printer port, an RS-232 serial port. The connector next to that which says not fitted is for an Acorn LAN. Instead, the unit features a more standard Ethernet card, which could be seen occupying the expansion card space above it. To the right we have a stereo headphone jack and finally a plug for a standard VGA type monitor. Popping the case open reveals an amazingly small motherboard for a desktop computer of this era. Here you can see it from the top down. In this next photo I pull the hard drive cable away so you can get a better look at the board. Here's the ARM chip itself. Apparently, as well as the RISC processor, this chip also contained an input-output controller, a video and a sound controller and a memory controller, all in the one package. It runs at 12 MHz and gives a performance of 7 MIPS, according to Wikipedia. Before we close the case, this is just a side view of the board. A couple of other things to mention before we leave the hardware. First, note the three-button mouse. 
The left button is select, as is common in Windows-based machines, but the center button is used by the operating system to display the menu associated with whatever is highlighted on the screen. The right button is called the adjust button. It's like select but has other functions also. Finally, note the top edge of the keyboard here. This is where the mouse plugs in. The button next to it is for reset. Right, so time to fire it up. So we'll push the on off button. And as is usual with these machines, lights tend to blink and noises are emitted. I've got an LCD screen plugged into it, simply because it's much clearer to see in the video. I did try and video with an older more screen, more typical of the era, but I got the flickering that I often get with these videos. So we've just used a standard LCD screen here. Gives you a nice clear image. Now this particular version of RISCOS 3 uh, has been configured with a few extras on startup and one of them is this program called vProtect which I assume is probably a virus checker. I'm not familiar with RISCOS 3 at all. In fact the first time I played with it was to make this video so I am a real novice with this operating system. Here's the desktop, and you can see down the bottom there uh, some icons, and these are very much like the shortcuts that you can get with Windows, and say Windows XP or Windows 7. Clicking them once brings up some programs. This one I've clicked is called Apps, and these are the programs that are in the ROM of the machine. What I'll do on this quick tour is to show you some of the things that make the RISC-OS 3 operating system a little different from Windows. One of these is this interactive help. Now if you start this up, you find you get this explanation dialog box at the bottom, and wherever you move the cursor, it explains what these particular items are. That's something quite new, and I found it, uh, I found it quite nifty. Running programs appear on the task bus at the bottom, so we'll just close our help down and I'll show you the task manager. So I've clicked that middle button and you can see the menu associated with this particular icon. Number of things there, but what I'll do is I'll go into the task manager and you can see some of the parameters there. So it's a way to check on what the system has got and what's running, a little like the task manager in Windows. But there's some nifty things, and here's one of them. If you want to make a RAM disk, all you do is simply use a slider bar to determine what sort of memory you want, and then you see down the bottom there, uh, suddenly there appears a RAM disk. So it's as easy to make as that. Very, very simple and intuitive. Another thing that's different from Windows is the way that you save programs. Now let me just open the edit program here. Of course every computer has a little edit utility, so we'll just type in a few words. And then I'll show you how it's saved. So we push the middle mouse button. First of all we've got to name the file. And uh, that OK button you might think that would save it but if it's a new file you don't use that I'll show you what you do so I put my name in you actually grab this icon on the top and you drag it to the drive or directory where you want to save it so that's something that can trip up Windows users like me if you don't read the instructions another thing you can do is to pull icons onto the desktop which they call the pin board and it creates an automatic shortcut so you can see I've done that with my document of course by clicking on it I can just open it up and edit it so it's a little similar to a shortcut in Windows but not quite the same if we'd done that in Windows it would have dragged the file onto the desktop rather than created a shortcut one of the programs bundled with the machine that I found quite intriguing and potentially quite useful is this one called Mastro and this allows you to produce a musical score 
simply by dragging your notes and various other things that you would have in a score to build your piece of music. So we can just create a simple melody like this and play it. It's quite faint, but hopefully uh, you can hear that. I found also on the disc, probably put by the person who I bought this off, a large number of musical scores. So if I drag this into the program, uh, we can play one of those. So let's do this. This is uh, Oxygen. There you can see the score there, far more complex than the one that I produced. So I'll just stop talking now and we can listen to uh, a bit of this music. It grows in complexity. Just as we get towards the end, I'll show you some of the menus associated with this program. And you can see there's a huge array of things that you can do. You can speed up the music, for example. Uh, you can convert the music to different keys, uh, different time signatures. Uh, it's a pretty powerful package if you're looking to edit or develop a musical score. Okay, so here's another thing. We'll just open our task manager, um, go to the menu, and what I'm going to do is open a task window and show you the command line interface. So RISC-OS 3 has a command line interface, uh, very much like the Amiga does, and Windows itself. So there you can see a catalog, in other words a directory of what's on the hard disk. It also has BBC Basic, so if you type in Basic, there you are in a, an advanced version of BBC Basic with uh, all of its structured programming features. Okay, so I'll quit out of the task window and it'll shut our command line interface down. You can also have the command line interface uh, occupying the whole screen, if that's what you wish. Now you can see we've got our editor and our Mastro program running, so I'll close these down, the Mastro one at least, and we'll have a look at the configuration program. I always like looking at configuration programs uh, when I get a new computer, just to see what particular things I can tweak. So there's the configuration application, so you can see it includes disks, which you can uh, set, you can give them a spin down delay. It's got floppies, okay, so you can actually add floppies there if you had a second one. There's a network configuration that you can tweak. 
this machine's not networked, although it does have an Ethernet card. So if you click the network configuration, uh, it does come up with a few options that you can choose. And if I was connected to the internet, I would uh, need to fill those in. So let's have a look at the uh, mouse. You can do speed. This is the keyboard. This is the memory. Uh, so you can tweak some parameters there. Sound. Fonts. How you want your windows to behave. And so ends our very brief tour of RISC OS 3. As I mentioned, it is an operating system that I'm not very familiar with, but I did find one or two things that were a little different from Windows, and that's what I've shown you. So, moving to manuals, I've got two of them. First is a, the first and the smaller of the two is this little booklet called the Acorn A4000 Welcome Guide, and the title harks back to the legacies of the BBC Micro, where you did have a welcome disk and a welcome guide for those particular uh, computers. And this is pretty good. It's very professional. It's easy to follow. Uh, that chart that was uh, in the page I just showed you uh, was a little bit like a pathway of increasing complexity, which told the user, or at least guided the user, as to how they should fully exploit their machine. So after you've gone through the welcome manual, it's time to uh, get serious and go with the user guide and applications guide. So this is really two books in one. So the user guide really moves on from where the welcome guide stop and looks at things in far more detail. And it's very comprehensive, uh, as you can see as I just scroll, scroll through these content pages here. It covers a lot of information talks about the command line and how you might use that. Lots of appendices which explain various things. There's some technical information in those appendices. It's professionally written, well illustrated and easy to read. So one of the better manuals I've come across. So what is the legacy of these machines? Well after the Archimedes desktop models, Acorn did continue with other desktop models called RISC PCs. The biggest leap forward for ARM processors though was through an Acorn subsidiary, ARM Holdings, who together with Apple and VLSI Technologies had developed and still license ARM cores. As mentioned earlier in the video, Low-cost, low-power microprocessors based on these ARM cores are ubiquitous in smartphones, tablets and other mobile devices. These chips are a legacy of Acorn and the Archimedes line. Well, I hope you enjoyed that look at the Acorn A4000. So until next time, keep well and we'll see you in the next video.